But yes, without further ado, we're incredibly grateful for both gentlemen for joining us this evening, Tim and Jean Guillaume, uh, because on premier season has officially begun. So it's such a busy time for them both. But not only that, it's also a public holiday today in France. So we're especially grateful that Jean Guillaume is with us tonight. So I hope your glasses are charged with something delicious. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Tim to kick off the evening. Good evening, Tim. Hi, Anna, and hi, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, it's a huge pleasure to welcome Jean-Guillaume Pratt um, tonight. Um, he stepped in relatively last minute. Um, Jean-Guillaume is probably one of the busiest people in Bordeaux, so it, we're particularly lucky to have him tonight. Um, obviously, we had to collar him on a bank holiday because we could never get him otherwise. Um, he's not in the office today. So thank you, Jean-Guillaume, and welcome to the Wine Society webinar. Good evening or good afternoon to all. A great pleasure and a privilege to join you. So before we kick off, I'd just like to mention a couple of things about Jean-Guillaume because um, um, Jean-Guillaume is a big name in Bordeaux. Um, you're actually from the Medoc, aren't you? Born and bred, Jean-Guillaume. I was born in saint Estef. Uh, Baptiste and married in the church in Saint Estephe, so across the uh, the Jal du Breuil, which is the natural border between Poyac and Saint Estephe. So um, uh, I've been driving for uh, for forty years, bypassing Lafitte uh, uh, every day. So it's a uh, it's um, an extraordinary dream for me to be able to um, walk to Lafitte in the morning after having by, driving by for so many such a long time. And, and I think I'm right in saying your family estate or your family property um, was for many years Cos d'Estournel, wasn't it? Um, which I think you can actually see from the, the um, from the tasting room at Lafitte, can't you? Up on the hill. Well, well the, the best view you have on, on Cos is actually from the uh, private dining room of the Rothschild family, from the chateau itself. There's, a, there's an exceptional view. I can't say I've ever, say I've ever been there, there Jean-Guillaume. There, there's, there's a... Um, <laughs> Actually, I was um, when I was in charge. Of course, we we used to manage to be very friendly with the the team, the the team at the chateau, especially in the kitchen. So then there was a dinner. We were making sure that the facade was enlightened. Um, it was uh, free publicity and free good marketing. Uh, uh, they don't do it anymore, which they should. <laughs> <laughs> so Jean, um, you actually joined three years ago the Lafitte Stable as chief executive CEO. Um, and that marked, in a way, uh, a, a bit of a change to the whole Lafitte team, didn't it? Because there were some retirements and, a, and an, almost a new generation started. Maybe you'd like to mention just a couple of, um, for a couple of minutes about Saskia and about Eric and about yourself joining um, relatively recently. Um, th there is a, a long studying tradition within the Rothschild family where the teams remain in place for a very long time and and everything is is burning in anticipation um looking at the next uh, generation with um, a, a certain time uh, length of time um and it all started after the second world war before the second world war um in in you know the Rothschild family was not coming very much to Poyac. um uh, they were at the base in london or in new york or obviously in paris uh, and then with, with the, the occupation of the of the chateau by, by the German forces, the German army during the Second World War, uh, a lot was destroyed and, and certainly the family realized that it was a very precious asset uh, and it needed to be to be shared um, more than it used to be. Um, and that's when uh, Elie de Rothschild, Baron Elie, came um, in, in the early, late 40s, early 50s as a young man um, and very much was, was almost every week at Lafitte with, with a succession of in those days were called régisseur, which basically was someone living on the property, uh, which was um, um, the other name in Bordeaux was homme d'affaires, which basically was businessman being in charge of running the properties. And then Baron Eric um, came in the early 70s as a, as a young age also, he was I think 33 or 34, um, and he has run Lafitte until then. Um, with, with various directors, which you have met, Eric uh, Collère, but of course, uh, Gilbert Ogvam and Charles Chevalier. Uh, and then the, the CEO position, which basically is a position which um, was in those days based in Paris, where you would see the entire 
uh, portfolio of the Rothschild family around the world. Um, um, my predecessor was Christophe Salin, who, who also retired after 33 years of, of um, exceptional services. And then three years ago, when I joined Baron Eric, when he asked me to join him, he also decided to pass uh, the reign of, of the property to his daughter, uh, sorry, yes, to his daughter, Saskia de Rothschild. So my, my birth is Saskia, she's 32 years old, uh, and I am, she does everything and I'm basically trying to do the rest. That's how it works. Fantastic. And, you, and your technical director, Eric Collard, um, he actually, he's been working for you for longer than 2018, hasn't he? He was at Ossière in the Corbière, is that right? Um, yes, Eric has been with us for, for 25 years. Um, so he has a long standing um, experience of our DNA. Um, may, maybe it's worth explaining briefly what, what we do. We, we have obviously uh, some assets in Bordeaux, some chateau, which we'll talk tonight, but we also have properties in Chile, in Colchagua, um, Colchagua Valley, which is about two hours south of Santiago. Um, it's called Viña Los Vascos, which is um, a very large estate of uh, more than 700 hectares of vineyards. Um, we also have a property in Mendoza, uh, in the Uco Valley, in Gualtajari, on the side of the Andes, called Bodegascaro. We, all, we have a vineyard in China, in the, in the Shandong province, um, which uh, is, for those who are not familiar with the Chinese map, it's across from the uh, Korean Peninsula uh, on the Chinese Sea, called Domaine de Longdai, which we started um, 10 years ago. Uh, and then we have a very large property in the Languedoc, uh, in the Massif de Fontfroide, in the Corbière, uh, called Domaine d'Ossière. So Eric uh, has joined us at Ossière, and then he was in charge of all these vineyards uh, around the world uh, for many, many years. And, and join us back in Bordeaux in 2016 when Charles Chevalier, um, who is very well known to the British wine lovers, um, retired. And now uh, Eric is fully dedicated only to Poyac, uh, two properties in Poyac, Chateau Lafitte and Du Armidon. And then there is another great technician who's been with us for some time, Olivier Tréguat, who's in charge of uh, L'Evangile and Riosec. This is something we wanted to change with Saskia because the level of attention to details um, uh, the fact that we, we go into bio farming, bio viticulture, um, um, needs that to have full dedication and attention to details. And, and the, the distances are actually quite big. So if you're spread too thinly, you know, to get from Poyac to, um, to Rio Sec in Sautan is takes about two hours, doesn't it, by car? Uh, or longer if the traffic's bad. Uh, absolutely, which means you don't do it every day or you do it yeah. once a week and, and that's not enough. Um, running a, a, a great property is very much like driving a Formula One. For, for Lewis Hamilton um, to, to win the Grand Prix uh, in, in the UK by half a second, that half a second is a tremendous attention to details uh, and many, many, many problems uh, going from the, the mind of the pilot to the cohesion of the team to the aerodynamics and, and other things. A fine wine is the same. And in order to be dedicated to attention to details, you need to have only one or two problems to look at. Which means if you if you if you are spread too much around, it doesn't work. I am not a believer, um, and that's also my experience working at LVMH when I was um, uh, the president of the wine division of LVMH. That you cannot have someone um, looking technically at ten estates or fifteen estates around the world. Uh, it doesn't work. It's it creates frustration and imperfection. So um, there will be a lot of people who are um, joining us this evening who probably won't have tasted the Grand Vin Lafitte because it's, um, it's certainly out of um, the reach of, of many people. So one question I really wanted to ask you, Jean-Guillaume, is if you, had to, if you had to describe what makes Lafitte Lafitte, what would be its characteristics, would you say? Um, there is a word that I like um, in order to describe Lafitte, it's, it's resilience. Um, the, re the resilience is the capacity to go through times with the same objective uh, and the same very long-term vision, and especially very difficult times. Mm -hmm. And the fact that that property has been owned by the same family with a, a very long-term vision has enabled to go through the Philoxera crisis, First World War, Second World War, uh, the crisis of the 70s, the poor vintages of the 60s. Um, and then all the crises we have seen um, uh, over the last uh, 40 years. That sense of resilience, of maintaining the same dream, the same ambitions, 
the same level of technical and financial investment in the vineyards, in the equipment, in the quality of the winemaking, but more important in the vineyards, in the replantation, the right clones, the right rootstocks, the right vineyards, the right varietals, makes the Lafitte quite unique. And that's quite similar to all the great first growth Bordeaux. That mm -hmm. sense of having something which goes above two or three generations. And the second thing that makes Lafitte very unique is that it, it's a wine that is quite easy to pick up on the blind testing. If you, if you take, for example, Latour, which has an extraordinary uh, dark chocolate uh, leather nose, and but very fresh at the same time, Lafitte has a very unique Havana cigar cigar box nose. And that comes from the Cadernet Sauvignon uh, on our great plateau. And I have to confess that we, we cannot explain this. This is the magic and the beauty of having a terroir that produce something that scientifically and technically cannot be explained or described, but it's a fact. So, yes, I mean, I would, I mean, I don't taste Lafitte sadly every day, but I, I have been fortunate enough to taste quite, quite a few bottles um, over, the, over the last few years. Um, there is something quite subtle about Lafitte. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't knock you off your chair it's subtle and, and that subtlety to me really comes out with time in the bottle and you really need to taste a Lafitte, a Lafitte after 20 years or more because that's when Lafitte I think comes really into its own, the, the, the nuances of flavour, um, it, it's, not, it's not brash in any way uh, and I'm not saying that any of the other first growths um, in Poyak are brash but it's maybe more subtle and maybe more difficult to understand when, when really young. I don't know if you'd agree with that, Jean-Guillaume. I, I would agree, but to a certain extent, and I'll, I'll explain why. And um, Lafitte is probably the only machine to go back in time that works, is, is that when, when, when you have the privilege to, to touch Lafitte either on, on the property, on the vineyards, on the site, or even, of course, when you open a bottle, you, you have a, a sense of there is something above your shoulders which is greater than you, and you go back in time and history. Um, it, it's full of tradition, but also with modernity. And that's where I, I come to your point. I totally agree with your points that uh, you needed to wait 20, 30 years to enjoy a, a Lafitte, such as an 86 or, or even a 96 or a 2000. But, but the, the sense of modernity and innovation um, that we have put into our, our winemaking, our aging, and our vineyard management over the last 10, 15 years, also makes it that you can you can you can enjoy Lafitte five ten years. Obviously, it's going to be much better one hundred years down the road. As uh, but but you can enjoy it when it's young. As as Baron Eric says, the most difficult in our in in the wine world are, are the first hundred years. And it's true that the wines have incredible longevity, don't they? I mean, you you still have, I'm sure, in the in the family reserve wines from the nineteenth century, which are still pristine. Um, to drink today. Uh, uh, absolutely. That, that's also one of the beauty of the, the great Cabernet Sauvignon from Bordeaux, uh, but not from everywhere. It's, it's really uh, uh, Margot Saint-Julien, uh, Pauillac and, and Saint-Estèphe. If it's almost 100% of Cabernet Sauvignon, um, it, it has that backbones, that structure, that aging potential, that acidity that keeps the wine alive for a very, very long time. Yeah, so so to me, Poyak is is what is the is the center of the universe when it comes to Cabernet Sauvignon. And um, if you say so, if you say so, you must be right. I may quote you on that. <laughs> you can if quote it's me, me on that. If, if it's me, I I I I will be told I am arrogant. <laughs> but, but if it's you, Tim, it must be true. <laughs> So, so we've just flashed up a map to show where, where um, the, the properties are, because obviously we're going to talk about the other properties as well. But if you, um, for everybody who's watching, you can see the map there. <clears throat> and um, on, the, on the western side of the map, you can see in, the, in purple, you've got um, Poyak. Maybe talk a little bit about gravel, because I know this sounds a, a, a bit... Um, well, should we say a bit um, train spottery to look at um, soils, but um, gravel is the key, isn't it, really, to what to what makes Lafitte Lafitte? Uh, absolutely. Could we go back to the map? So maybe I could explain just a few words on Bordeaux for, for those who may not be absolutely 
um, familiar with, with with Bordeaux. Um, one thing which is which is important to to have in mind is is that uh, Bordeaux has the, the the two side of the river, the Dordogne and the Garonne, that are joining forces to create the Gironde estuary, which is the biggest estuary in Europe. And we we say in Bordeaux that you have the left bank and the right bank. The the right bank is is towards the east, and the left bank is towards the west. And what you should have in mind is that there are four major areas um, in Bordeaux. The left bank, where the Médoc is, uh, and that starts from the north of Bordeaux all the way to uh, Bégadon, saint christoli uh, La Tour de Bille. Uh, and then you have the south of Bordeaux with the Grave. Uh, and then further down is Sauterne with uh, Barsac and, and, and Sauterne. Uh, and then saint croix du Mont. And then you have the right side uh, of the river, um, which is where saint emilion and Pomerol and Puy-Seguin, Montagne saint emilion Fronsac are located, uh, which are more calcareous soil um, and, and which are at the limit of the département of, of Gironde. And then the fourth area is called the Entre-de-Mer, which is in green um, on your map, which is between the two rivers. So we call it between the two sea because it used to be sea. Uh, and, and that's where the the mass uh, uh, production of, of the um, entry-level Bordeaux, uh, very good wines are being produced for, for a very long time. And this is the biggest um, Appalachian vineyard in, in France. We, we are in, in the northern part of the Médoc, starting from the, the, the north of Bordeaux, you, you have uh, uh, Margot, Saint-Julien, then Pauillac and Saint-Estèphe. Uh, Pauillac is about um, 3,500 hectares, so it's, it's relatively small, um, uh, and it has only uh, mainly class five rows. On the bank of the river, whether you are in Saint-Estèphe, Pauillac, Saint-Julien, and Margot, you have these gravels that you were mentioning. Team, these gravels um, have been carried by the river, and they come from the Pyrenees mountain, from the Mada Delta uh, part, which is the Spanish part of the Pyrenees. There are very poor gravels, which are not suitable for any farming activity, except vineyards. And unlike in, in Burgundy or unlike in Champagne, these gravels have been discovered and, and put in place for vineyards uh, quite recently in the 1750s. Uh, before that, uh, fine wines was not really produced in Bordeaux, which is not the case of, of Burgundy. So it's a very poor land, um, only suitable for vineyards. And, and these gravels are suitable because that's where the Cabernet Sauvignon with roots going deep into the soil with high density of plantations are producing these wines with, with this level of concentrations and maturity and tannins, but also acidity and freshness that gives this aging potential. And you find these profound gravels on the side of the river, and that's exactly where, where Du Milan and Lafitte are located. And this is in opposition to what you find uh, on the right side of the river in Pomerol and saint emilion where you have more clay and more calcareous soil the, the clay is more suitable for the Merlot uh, and for the Cabernet Franc, and it produces wine which are more voluptuous, more charming, more seductive, more feminine, probably more easy to understand, with less aging potential, but more immediate charms. And the Cabernet Franc, uh, such as at Cheval Blanc, uh, produces wines which are extremely spicy, uh, green pepper, uh, very uh, intense, almost Indian curry, and that's an extraordinary blind. So, Two different expression of, of wine coming from the silence. Great. Well, that's a very um, neat explanation. Thank you, Jean Guillaume. Now, um, you mentioned um, Duar Milan. Um, so um, I think we should maybe um, actually, maybe just um, before we move on to Duar Milan, um, did to know about any developments, recent developments, or any plans at Lafitte um, going forward in the next few years? What uh, what's on the what's on the what's what, what's on your agenda at the moment at Lafitte? So um, we so we own these two class five growers in 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 Pauillac, Du Armilon and and uh, Chateau Lafitte. So that's that's a very large um, holding of vineyard. That's about two hundred hectares. So that's that's quite important. <laughs> Um, these two estates are, are managed under the same umbrella when it comes to vineyard management because they are next to each other. So it, it's, it's the same team and management uh, when it comes to vineyards, which allows us to have prime equipment and, and a lot of reactivity uh, with the same dream and same vision. When it comes to winemaking, it's very different 
Dior Milon has its own um, uh, barrel, its own vats, its own buildings, um, its old chateau. It's, um, it's one of the very few chateaux which is in the village of Poyac in town. And we're yeah. very proud of that. And we've just completed a, a total reinvestment of redoing Dior Milon, which was much needed. It has been bought by Baron Elie de Rothschild in 1962. And, and not much had been done on the building itself since then. So we have a new fully um, equipment at, at Dua. And then to answer your question more precisely, Tim, our, our, next, uh, our next project is to do the same at Lafitte. Um, Lafitte is, is, a, is a property where 101% uh, of our energy over the last 10 years or 15 years has been put in the vineyards. Um, and now we need to put a little of energy on, on the buildings and, and the winemaking equipment. Um, the last big project that had been done at Lafitte was done in, in 84, 85 um, with the, the secular cellar, which is called the, the Chez Beaufil, made by the Catalan architects, Ricardo Beaufil. And this is a place that has been copied uh, around the world uh, widely, even including ourselves. We've copied that at L'Evangile. We've copied that at our vineyard in China. Um, it's been copied at Opus One as well. Uh, and our, our next project is, is to build... Um, uh, a new winemaking facility, a new reception of harvest, a new first year cellar. Um, and we will be completed by 2024, 2025. It's, uh, it's a big project because uh, you do that for uh, the next two generations. And, and when you touch Lafitte, you touch something which has such a strong DNA uh, that you have to be very careful in the way you're doing. So we, we like to say at Lafitte that you don't see the technology, you don't see uh, the modernity. It is there, but it's hidden behind the walls. And this is exactly in the line where we want to go. And is the idea, Jean-Guillaume, that you will keep the relatively traditional wooden fermenters and that kind of thing, which are very much the tradition at Lafitte? We, we are likely, we haven't made any final arbitrage yet, but we are likely um, uh, not to use them anymore. Okay, okay. You heard it here first. <laughs> I'm sorry? I, I said, we heard it here first. I don't know if that's common knowledge or not, but... Um... No, 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 it's, it's, it's not, not a final arbitrage being made, but, but that's, that's one of the options uh, that is yeah. on the table and which we are uh, considering seriously. Um, simply because there are today methods which you know are are, are giving us a, a slightly a better precision. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've talked quite a lot about Poyac, um, and you've discussed a little bit about the right bank. So I'm I'm keen to to mention Levangile, um, which is one of the family properties, relatively small compared with its Poyac neighbours, but nevertheless, in in Pomerol terms not small. So perhaps we can talk a little bit about L'Evangile. So P Pomerol, um, as we said on the map, is located on the right side of the river. It's, it's between Libourne and, and Saint-Emilion, uh, about exactly in the middle. Um, it's, it's one of the smallest um, high-end appellation in Bordeaux. It's 900 hectares. Um, so it's big for Burgundy, but it, it's rather, rather small for Bordeaux. Uh, and and L'Evangile is, is literally, for those who are not familiar, located uh, between Cheval Blanc and Petrus. It, it's right at the border of the, the, the Saint-Emilion appellations. The immediate neighbors of, uh, of uh, L'Evangile on, on the south is Cheval Blanc, on the north is Petrus, um, on the east is Vieux Château Sertan, uh, and on the other side is, is La Conseillante. Um, and we, it's, it's a property that um, was bought by Baron Eric in 1990, so it's a very recent um, acquisition for us. Um, it, it's one of the largest uh, property on what we call the Plateau de Poyac, uh, sorry, Plateau de Pomerol. The, the plateau is this blue clay uh, piece of land where you have uh, Petrus, VCC, La Conseillante, L'Evangile, and part of Gazin. And we, we, are, the, we are the biggest there. Um, and it, it's, it's, been, um, it's been managed over the last um, 40 years, 30 years, no, 30 years, sorry. No, no, sorry. Yeah, 30 years. It's been managed really by the team of Lafitte. Um, and we changed with Saskia um, last year. So 2020 is the first vintage where, where L'Evangile is totally independent um, with Olivier Tregoat and Juliette Couder being in charge. Um, 
with a better attention to details and 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 stepping into a new a new story a new adventure we are very um happy and proud of owning l'evangile and um we see a bright future for it with with more attention more dedications and as i said early on the merlot is producing a more silky approach to wine uh, it's more voluptuous um it's almost as if you have skill um sick in your mouth it it's very silky um very cotton in a positive way um with maintaining the freshness which you'll be able to taste the wine team you'll see the 2020 pomerol are, are fairly low in alcohol uh, compared to to other vintages mm. um and a beautiful ph so they're extremely balanced um it it it's a wine which is very surprising i had the privilege um actually uh, the day before yesterday to taste petrus at petrus along with l'evangile which we brought a sample and when you taste petrus this year it's almost burgundian uh in 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 the um, in in the wine as 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 at l'evangile and the wines are extremely voluptuous and delicate this year um and that's probably a change in style that um, we see in pomerol and obviously that uh, l'evangile is following and and i think i'm right in saying jean guillaume that um you know since the rothschilds bought the property in the 90s um you've been or replanting and therefore the the old cabernet franc vines were replanted um and those are just starting to really come on stream now aren't they yes in 2020 we had 12% of cabernet franc in, in the grand vin of l'evangile um that that reflects about the um, we we have in total 18% of cabernet franc um the, the vines are now 20 years of age which is absolutely perfect um so it, um, the the cabernet franc will get into the grand vin uh, now in in a much bigger proportion than it used to be we also funny enough have have a small parcel of cabernet sauvignon uh um which is a small parcel we own which is um, across the road from l'église cliné uh and and instead of being clay it it's a very small part of gravels so we've planted cabernet sauvignon it, it went partially into the grand vin this year mm-hmm. um and as again we with global warming uh, being a reality as it is in the south of england it is a reality in bordeaux uh, having more cabernet franc and more cabernet sauvignon also allows us to have wines which keep some freshness yeah. uh and 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 some aging potential that that brings us rather neatly onto the question of climate change um which i know is um is at the heart of many uh members um concerns hotter vintages which are more difficult to handle um i'm interested to know how the D, the domain baron rothschild um estates are coping with the challenges of of increasingly warm vintages Jean Guillaume um the global warming has has two incidents two consequences the, the first one and that's exactly what we are seeing nowadays in in bordeaux with the the heavy rain we we have had for a week is that you it seems that um, you can go from heat to cold from rain to drought uh, within a week um through the cycle of the vines so it it means a much better reactivity much better attention um much better care probably uh, also more team involved um and it 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 forces everyone to be more uh, efficient the the second thing that um, uh, global warming is creating is, is that you need to harvest a bit earlier uh it's it's quite easy to reach quickly the full phenolic ripeness of the grapes than it used to be uh and, and therefore uh, you you need to anticipate in order to be able to um, to produce uh, wines that still have freshness um i always remember when i i joined uh, cause d'estonel as as a young man in 1996 when the the harvester were arriving um uh, in mid september they were giving a a set of plastic uh, boot and raincoat because it was going to rain during the harvest it was a standard procedure um and the question was I I will start to harvest when I see botrytis in the vineyard because it was going to happen. Uh it was the standard procedure in Burgundy in Bordeaux in Champagne um throughout the 70s, yeah. 80s and 90s. And today when the harvesters arrive we we give them t-shirts and a and a and a sun hat. Uh that <laughs> cl- clearly has changed in a positive way. Uh and um and so to answer your question more precisely we are working on the date of harvest, we are working on on the canopy management 
Um, we are working on our prunings. Um, we are also working on having uh, maybe different clones, uh, different rootstocks. Um, obviously also, which is a long-term work, which is also carried by uh, the University of Bordeaux, uh, maybe different vitals, looking at vitals from, from other parts in Europe, especially from Northern Portugal. Uh, so there's many, many, many things in, in, into, into consideration that where, where we are going and which are led by Bordeaux as a whole uh, in order to, to follow that trend. Very interesting. I'm conscious of time, Jean-Guillaume, and um, I, I don't want to miss out on a, on a little conversation about 2020 Bordeaux. Um, as I said at the start, uh, our timing is excellent because the first wine was released two days ago, which was um, Cheval Blanc. Um, um, Lafitte stroke Mouton, the, the two branches of the Rothschild family have very kindly um, organized a tasting this year like they did last year for the key uh, wine buyers in the UK. Um, they, I believe, chartered a private plane to take samples from Bordeaux to um, Wadston Manor, um, which is the, the Rothschild seat um, in England. Um, and so in, in about a couple of weeks time, I shall be going up there to taste the 2020s. So uh, I'm very keen to hear your take on the vintage as a whole, um, Jean-Guillaume, and specifically for, for the properties of DBR. Um, the, the first thing I would like to say is that um, um, I organized this tasting last year at, at Waddesden Manor, and we, we are doing it with pleasure again this year. This is the only place in the world where we do that. We don't do that in Asia. We don't do that in the US. Um, we do it in the UK for two reasons. The first one is, is because th th there are um, wine merchants, such as the Wine Society in the UK, which have great knowledge, and we know they can understand barrel samples, and they are able to advocate the style and the quality of the wines. Um, to, to, to their clients. And, and the second is because the property is owned by uh, Lord Rothschild, um, which is a member of the family. So we, we know we are in good hands. Uh, and we put in place, as you described, a logistic to make sure that the samples are very fresh uh, and been taken from barrels two days before. Um, the first thing, Tim, is when you ask about the, about the last vintage, it will tell you it's the greatest he's ever produced and it is for sale. So you have to be cautious <laughs> with, <laughs> with my answer. Um, but, but no, no, what happened in, in 2020 is we, we are on the same line than 88, 89, and 90. Uh, we, we have a, a trilogy with 2018, 2019, and 2020, a trilogy of three great vintages, fairly different, uh, but all of exceptional quality. Um, and and it's, it's, it's not very common in Bordeaux that you have three great vintages in a row, which um, are great in all the appellations of Bordeaux from, from all sides of the river. And it only happens um, at the end of the 80s, and that's what we have uh, this year. A fairly small crop. Um, we, we have about uh, um, 15, 20% less than last year uh, as, as our overall production. And, and wines which have um, a beautiful freshness. If the 2090 are more glamorous and, and great, the 2020 are probably more aristocratic, slightly more intellectual, uh, probably with a better aging potential, uh, beautiful wines. Yes, I mean, I've, I've already tasted quite extensively and I, I completely agree with you. They are, they are wines that are maybe slightly less easy to understand than um, the previous two vintages, um, but they have fantastic potential because there is lots of color, the, the tannins there um, are clearly there and the wines have a real freshness, um, despite it being a relatively hot vintage or a hot and dry vintage. So I'm very, um, I think it's a very promising vintage indeed, but it will require a little bit more explanation maybe than 19 vintage, which was pretty much ubiquitously a um, good vintage across the board. Absolutely. And um, what I found in, in 2020, it was much more tiring um, to do the assemblage, the blending yes. sessions. Um, you know, after 40, 50 samples, it's starting to be very tricky. The acidity is, is there. So it, it's a tough exercise for you, team, this year, because the, the, the vintage is, 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 a, is only for professional. As if you're, 
you, you've put in the hands a new a new car from Aston Martin or Bentley or Rolls Royce with a, a very a big engine and a, and a new engineering that needs a little bit of skill uh, to mm. be able to manage it. So the volumes are down, particularly on the left bank. Um, I understand. Um, I know it was particularly challenging this year in Sutown, and we haven't discussed Riosec. And just before we go to the Q and A, um, I'd be interested to know how Riosec got on in a very challenging Sutown vintage. So Riosec is the, the the property we own in um, in Sutern since 1984. It's a first grow in 1855. We tend to believe that they, they are they are um, a small numbers of first grow as well in in Sotern from the imperial classification of Napoleon the Third in 1855. Uh, Riosec is is adjacent to Chateau d'Iquem, um, um, quite similar piece of land. Obviously, Iquem is, is mystical and magical, but Riosec is just on the shadow uh, of Iquem. Uh, it's 88 hectares, so it's a very large property, um, and it produces uh, some some beautiful botrytis uh, um, uh, botrytis sauternes wines, which are uh, rich and voluptuous. Uh, in 2020, it was a tricky vintage, unfortunately, because on the last two weeks, which are very crucial at the end, uh, by by mid October, the rain came, uh, and 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 when you have too much rain and not enough winds. Uh, you you don't get the noble rot, uh, you get the the black botrytis, which which doesn't feed. So we've been able to produce some um, very good sauternes, but in very small tiny quantity in 2020. It was it was a tricky vintage. Uh, unfortunately, it's a it's a very stressful exercise because you can lose everything within two or three weeks. The most important in sauternes are the last uh, 100 meters. Yes, yes. I mean, I have to say the wine society tries to champion the wines of Sauternes and Barsat because we know how difficult it is for the, for the growers in, in both uh, parts of Sauternes. Um, and of course, it's so expensive to make Sauternes because you have to do frequent pickings, don't you? And the, and the re- yields are absolutely minuscule. So um, we will be supporting um, um, the growers of Sotown with with a small offering this year, but but probably not uh, as many wines as we would normally do. Well, thank you, thank you for them. Yes, they they we all need support in Sotern and and yeah. and others more than us. We are privileged to to have other estates in Bordeaux um, to help us. But those who only own a property in Sotern are are in, into a, a very stressful situation. Yes, indeed. Great. Well, I think I think we're ready now for a few questions, Anna. If uh, if you can fire away, we certainly are. Thank you both so much. What a wonderful uh, forty minutes. Um, it's been informative and entertaining. So thank you. We have had masses of questions in. So I hope you don't mind, members. I'm going to group together um, where we've had lots of similar questions. Um, we've had three discussion points in particular have come up more than anything else. Um, the first of those is you've just been talking about difficult vintage um, in Sotern, but all of us here in the UK have been witness to what has been a very, very difficult start to 2021 as well. Um, and I wonder, Jean-Guillaume, if you could talk a little bit about um, whether you suffered from the frosts that we've had over the last few weeks. So the, the, the vineyard in France, um, and that's, that's a little bit in Champagne, that's the southern part of Burgundy, the Rhone Valley, Provence, um, and part of Bordeaux, um, as well as the Languedoc, actually, and we've lost in Languedoc, were hit by, by frost uh, around mid-April. Uh, you have two kinds of frost. You have what we call the black frost and the white frost. The black frost it comes very early at one or two o'clock in the morning, it, it comes from upstairs and boom, um, goes down into the vineyard. There's nothing much you can do uh, about it, unfortunately. And then there is a white frost that comes when the sun comes out. So it's more five, six o'clock in the morning. It lasts for one or two hours. This you can fight um, with either uh, helicopters or um, some fires just to warm by one or two degree um, the, the, the soil. Um, when it was uh, black frost, um, it was impossible to fight, and people have lost um, a large part of their vineyards in the Grave area, in Barsac, unfortunately. A little less in Sauternes, in, in, at Riosec, we've lost about 50% uh, of the production. 
but not on top of the hill, more on the bottom of the hill. And um, so the, the, the high end of the quality of Hirsek is being, is being protected. When it comes to Poyak, we have not lost uh, anything. Um, uh, we had helicopters flying to, to mash the air um, and that works. And in Pomerol, we've simply um, used some candles and, and warmed the air, but it was for five days in a row, uh, very stressful for the team. You have to do it from one o'clock to four o'clock in the morning, but, but it works. So unfortunately, those who've suffered the most uh, in Bordeaux are in the Grave and in Sauterne. And, and as again, um, it's only that's in the next two weeks that we are going to see the real consequences um, because you, you can have a, a second budding that comes afterwards. Um, and so we're going to see by, by the end of May if there has been a second budding and, and therefore a second crop that could be taken into consideration at the later stage if the temperature allows in September, October. I believe you're just past the Sunday glass, aren't you now, which is the considered the threshold for frosts. So at least there will be no more catastrophic frosts this year. On, on touche du bois. <laughs> on touche du bois. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we've also had uh, several people, Robert, Gail, George, um, ask if you could expand, you did touch on it, Jean-Guillaume, but expand on the new grape varieties uh, that are permitted. Are you considering using them? Um, is there any plans to plant them, etc.? Um, the, the, the broader uh, Bordeaux AOC, uh, Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée, or AOP, has already um, allowed, uh, by regulations, the, the growers to use some vineyards, some grapes from, from Portugal, such as the Torriga Nacional, the Tinta Rorige, the Tinta Francesa, but as well as Marcelin, which you'll find in the Languedoc and, and, and a few others. Um, so that's a very important first step. Um, no doubt that the more prestigious appellation will follow that, that route as well and that path, but it must be done with a very careful uh, uh, and a very precise exercise because you, you don't want to change the style of the wine, you don't want to change the DNA, you don't want to change the total honesty of who you are. And, and in order to try that, you need to, to try over a long period of time, uh, years, uh, to see if it fits. So, that's, that's work is being carried by the uh, Faculté de de Bordeaux, uh, as well as by people like ourselves. We have a dedicated um, research and development team, uh, which is highly qualified, which is um, led by Manuela, a young Colombian engineer that, that works for us, and she has a team around her. And uh, so we are looking at all these options. But what probably will be done in Bordeaux is using grapes, which are used in Spain and Portugal and in Languedoc in the south of France, we, which are more robust and, and that cut can find um, heat waves, potential heat waves in August and the drought as well, which is another problem. Thank you very much. So watch out members, um, just not immediately. <laughs> um, we've also had a lot of questions and a lot of conversation in the chat, Jean-Guillaume, about how you combat the fraud or fake um, wines. That's a very good question. Um, the, the first thing is we, we look very carefully at auction. Um, um, we, we have a very close relation with all the major auction houses in the world. Um, and, and most of the time they ask us to have a look uh, when they are suspicious, when there is a doubt on wines that they would put um, for, on their catalog. And, and, and very often they don't do it because we cannot certify where it's coming from and there is a doubt. So the first thing is the relation we have with the auction houses. The second thing I can say as an advice to any consumers, if it's too cheap, uh, it's not true. It's, uh, you have also to, to be in a world where if it looks too good, um, then, then, then there is a doubt. So you should pass your way. The, the third thing is we, we are extremely vigorous, aggressive and tough. Uh, when we hear about counterfeit, especially in China, uh, we have a fully dedicated team in Shanghai and in Bordeaux looking at that. It's big expenses for us, but we spend a lot of time and energy on, on, on fighting that uh, legally uh, with the help of the Chinese authority and the police. And I have to say that the, 
the Chinese administration is very much concerned of that. And Lafitte is one of the brands which in China has been facing some major difficulties over the years. But over recent years, the, the last two or three years, we've reduced dramatically the numbers of, of counterfeit uh, uh, small atelier and, and small lab, which are trying to produce that. And we do it with the local authorities. My only advice uh, to anyone who wants to buy our wines is buying from buy it from reliable wine merchants uh, and good names. Uh, it, it's too too good to be true if you buy it from an unknown house and if it's too cheap. Very sound advice. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I strongly recommend to use the Wine Society. That's the best option. <laughs> Quite agree. <laughs> Tim's nodding profusely. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have a question now from Greg Bennett, and Greg has asked, while I'm sure Lafitte will continue to, to use traditional corks, what are your views on cork replacements, including screw caps for high quality reds? I understand Chateau Margaux have an ongoing experiment aging wines under different cork styles. Does Lafitte have anything similar? Crew, crew, um, 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 sorry, screw caps to our opinion. And, and um, in my previous professional life, I was in charge of wines such as Cloudy Bay, for example, the Cape Mantel in, in Western Australia, which are under uh, screw cap. It works very well for white wine. It works very well for wines, which I'm going to be enjoying the next five years. When it comes for aging, uh, it's a different ball game. And my, I will not comment on, on, on Chateau Margaux and their experience, but my modest experience is that the 10, 15 years, you, you are losing something if you are in screw cap when it comes for, for red wine. Um, now, when it comes for cork, uh, frankly speaking, uh, when it comes from luxury products, which can be aged for one or two generations, there's nothing better than cork, but the, 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 the duty and the job, which is ours, is to provide the best quality cork, um, and that's possible. Um, the, the, the great producers from the Alentejo in Portugal are very much into hand. It's only a question of, of uh, dedication and cost. And we, we spare no energy and no investment to be able to, 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 to put that. So at this stage, uh, uh, I don't see in any way Lafitte or Carriade or Duart or Evangile or, or Riesec uh, not being um, uh, put in bottles with something else but uh, normal standard high quality corks. Thank you so much. Um, I hope that answered the question. I think it was very thorough. Thank you. Uh, the, the, there was one point on, on recorking. Um, we, 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 we recork the wines which are at the Chateau every 25 years, every 20, 25 years. We no longer uh, recork uh, bottles from private individuals which have been bought to us simply because we don't know how it's been stored, uh, where it's been bought. Um, uh, so it's difficult. Obviously, um, the question could be asked, and it happens sometime, if, if a reliable um, partner, such as, for example, the Wine Society has some um, uh, inventories of Lafitte, which has been their seller for 20 years, 30 years, and we know for sure it's been shipped directly from our seller to the seller of the Wine Society, the question to, could be asked. Uh, but if there is a certain level of uncertainty, we would not do it. Um, whilst we're talking about ageing, we've had a few members ask uh, whether you have an opinion on the recent space experiments. Oh, that's the bottle of Petrus going in space. You know, yes. wh why not? I, I, I hope it will sell for 10 million euro instead of one. So it will make <laughs> Lafitte looking cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. I like it. <laughs> Um, we have another question from Robin Crew, and Robin has asked that given Lafitte's adoption of modern methods, can we expect Lafitte to start making any entirely organic wines or even natural wines at some point in the future? Uh, natural wine, probably not, because it doesn't really mean uh, anything, and uh, that's you're, you're moving away from uh, from healthy products. Uh, but uh, bio one and bio farming, this is the this is what we are doing already. So yes. I thought so. Thought we'd check. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Jean Guillaume, I, I have a question on that subject. Um, biodynamic viticulture, is that something that you have experimented with or are you considering? We, we are experimenting. Um, uh, L'Evangile is very much advanced on that. We, we also have some large parcel at, uh, at uh, Lafitte and Duart on, on that. Um, 
there is behind uh, biodynamy, which is a, a great, uh, a great approach, and and some extraordinary ones such as Ponte Cane are produced, or Palme are produced in biodynamy. There is also a, a philosophical approach um, that is is not rational, uh, so it, it's more intellectual, um, and we probably are not yet there. Uh, saying that we want to, uh, to experiment, we want to try. Um, the first most important is to be bio farming, which is a given. Uh, biodynamic is something even more. Um, I, I don't see ourselves in total honesty going 100% in biodynamic um, in the years to come, but having part of it as an understanding and, and learning from it for sure, yes. Wonderful. That leads me perfectly onto the next question, which is about learning. Obviously, you have got other um, estates around the world. Um, and one member, Simon Aspinall, has asked, what lessons do you think that new and old world winemakers are teaching and learning from each other? It's a very good question. Um, the, the first thing is, is no one on planet Earth, when it comes to wine, is better than the other ones. Um, and I've never believed that you, you can bring knowledge from Bordeaux to the South uh, Hemisphere and vice versa. Uh, everyone has his own uh, specificity, understanding, culture, know-how. What you learn from the Southern Hemisphere in Bordeaux today is the management of irrigation, water, and the drought, and the stress of the vineyards. That's a key learning, uh, key learning exercise. What the Southern Hemisphere is learning from Bordeaux is the excess of water at some time, the excess of rain uh, and, and the variation of cycles um, in the weather conditions. Um, what we are learning also um, from, from the new world um, is, is the quality of the winemaking, uh, the attention to details, which uh, has been put in place in, in certain places, such as California, for example. Uh, and, and that's also uh, Bordeaux is, is at the state of the heart in terms of equipment uh, and winemaking. That was, probably was not the case in the 80s and 90s where uh, uh, producers in, in, in the Napa Valley were a, a bit ahead of, of Bordeaux. Today, probably not the case anymore. So there's constant exchanges. Um, and as Tim say, um, Eric Collet, who's now the, the head winemaker at Lafitte and, and, and Duar was first in charge of our uh, foreign uh, estates. Uh, so that cross learning, cross exercise, uh, cross understanding is, is fundamental. Um, the thing which I, I see the most fascinating is, is what is happening in China. Um, I, I have had the privilege in my career to, to launch the, the two uh, greatest wines in China, uh, Ao Yun and, and Long Dai, um, Long Dai, which, which is owned by, by DBR. And, and when you look at these two estates, but there are also other great wines in, in, in Ninxia and other area, it's all about vineyard management. It's all about having all vineyards, uh, being able to harvest a fruit which is healthy, um, and, and that comes from a, an understanding that comes from the old world. Uh, and on the same time, what we learn from, from the Chinese is, is, is the attention to details. They are great farmers. I remember the farmers in Shangri-La in the Himalayas, and I, I see the farmers we have in, in the Kyushan Valley in Shandong. They, they are extraordinary attention to detail farmers. They are great in fruit management, um, and you learn that. So it's cross-fertilization. Thank you very much. Um, I have another question on learning, if you don't mind, more of a personal question from Len Panet, who said, uh, with Jean Guillaume's long and illustrious experience, what does he know now that he wishes he had known 20 or 30 years ago? Uh, the, the thing I know is I know less than before. Uh, and the, the older I am getting, the more humble and modest I am, I am becoming. And, and, and desperate to, um, to learn more because it's a very complex situation. And I trust and I believe it's like a, a doctor. The more you are experienced, the more you, you become a, a dubious of being right and you are looking at a 360 around you to say, uh, well, I probably uh, had some conviction they were wrong. Let's be open-minded as much as possible. Fantastic answer. Thank you very, very much. Um, we've probably got time for one more, uh, Jean Guillaume, and uh, it's actually, funnily enough, was asked by two members, um, but I personally would, I'm desperate to know the answer as well. If you had to pick your, well, it's two-sided. First of all, if you had to pick one wine from the Chateaus, which, which would be your wine to have forever? 
And the second is, what is your house wine? What wine do you drink normally on an evening? Um, probably the, the greatest wine today, um, and sorry for being pompous and pretentious, but I am a Bordelais, so by definition, I am entitled to, uh, probably was, was Lafitte 1870, which is quite, quite uh, as Baron Eric would say, it's rather drinkable today, isn't it? Um, so uh, pr probably that one or maybe the 59. And uh, as, as a house wine, uh, I drink a lot of L'Evangile nowadays. Uh, the 2012, 2011, 2013 Evangile, which have a beautiful shining fruit. It has that red berry, like, like a great Pinot Noir to a certain extent. The, the heart of the sherry, it's beautiful wine and, and very fresh. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to squeeze one more in. You've just obviously mentioned one particular vintage of Love Um, Do you have uh, any... I apologize, I forgot who asked this question, but it was a wonderful question earlier. Which are the most underrated vintages in your opinion? That's a good question. Um, 99, uh, 1999, when, when you open them nowadays, uh, um, frankly, they are very surprising. They're beautiful to drink now. They're not going to get any better in total honesty. They have reached a, a plateau. They will stay there for another uh, 10, 15 years. The, the 99 Bordeaux are absolutely beautiful. Um, I'm not sure if they are very expensive in the UK, but I doubt. Um, it's been a little bit under the shadow. So I would put 99 as a consumer buy to, to, drink, to drink a beautiful one that has reached its plateau uh, at probably the best ratio, price, quality, and stage of its life. But I will Fantastic. team to team will be probably more expensive than me on that field. Well, that was a question from Lee Raybold. So thank you, Lee. Apologies, I didn't get your name in there, but um, a great question. And now the, there's going to be a rush on 1999 vintage. <laughs> no one am will be I able to buy it. Am I allowed to ask one last very? Quick... Of course, Tim. I'm just very interested to know, Jean Guillaume. Um, does the family, the Rothschild family, have any? more acquisitions in mind, either in France or elsewhere in the world? Um, we would love to have something in, in North America, um, um, and most likely California. Um, so that, that is an idea that we are contemplating and looking at different options, um, certainly. Um, we used to be involved um, some 20 years ago with, with Shalone, which was a, yes. um, a, a group of great properties. Um, and then we would like to, to go back to California. Um, we, we would love to have something in another vineyard in France, and especially we don't have in our portfolio um, an extraordinary dry white wine. Um, so that is something that, that we, we, we would favor. Uh, and, and maybe um, in other parts of Europe, such as Spain or Italy. But that, 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 would, be, um, that would be our dreams. We, we probably would not look for the moment at um, faraway places such as Australia or New Zealand or South Africa. Um, we already have some vineyard, as I mentioned, in China and South America. That's already complex to manage. Uh, so we, we want to make something that we know we can handle. Perfect. Thank you very much. Well, on behalf of the tastings team, I'd like to thank um, the members for joining us this evening, Tim for joining us, and without fail, Jean Guillaume. What a glorious evening. I will hand over to Tim to do a final goodbye, but on behalf of all of us, thank you for taking the time this evening. It really has been a jewel in our tastings and events crown for 2021. So thank you very much. Yes, I can only reiterate, and um, jean -Guillaume, much appreciated you joining us, particularly on a, on a bank holiday. I think you deserve a very large glass of Evangile 2012. So thank you. And thanks to the tastings team as well. Well, th thank you to all. And I, I, I just would like to say that Bordeaux, the Bordeaux wine industry will not be what it is today without the British wine lovers uh, over the last uh, 150 years and the British wine trade. So if there is one strong connection between two countries, it's between the, the UK and, and, and Bordeaux. And uh, we own it to Aliénor d'Aquitaine who used to own England and not the other way around. Bonsoir, merci. Au revoir, au revoir. Au revoir.